Sorry. Good evening and welcome to the March 8th, 18th regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. As a point of order, I would ask everyone to turn off their cell phones. And then if you would stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Baker, could you take roll? Sure. President Singer. Here. Vice President McFarland. Here. Secretary Baker. Here. Treasurer Fidel. Here. Member Blasey. Here. Member Lauterbach. Here. And Member Rausch. Here. All seven present. Great. All seven present. We'll move into the consent agenda, agenda item two. Uh, we have five items. Item 2.1 is approval of the meeting minutes from February 18th. Item 2.2 is uh, persons recommended for employment for the 18-19 school year. Item 2.3 are persons that have announced their resignations. Item 2.4 is approval of payment of the school system bills for January. And item 2.5 our legal invoices for payment. Would anyone like to add or subtract anything from the consent agenda? Seeing none, at this time I'll entertain a motion um, to approve consent agenda items 2.1 to 2.5. So moved. Second. A move by McFarland, second by, is it John, uh, Phil, yep. Roush. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? And it passes unanimously. We'll move into item three, which is Board of Education Matters presentation to the board. Mr. Sherrill. We have two wonderful ch shining stars to present to you this month. <clears throat> and our first one is Jing Chang Wang. Jing Chang, if you'd come up and join me, and I'll read a little bit about Jing Chang and what he's done for us. We stand right here, Jing Chang. Mr. Wong's joined the MPS team this fall as our Chinese Mandarin teacher in the elementary foreign language pilot program at Woodcrest Elementary School. Before coming to MPS, Jing Chang taught at the Midland Chinese School. Mr. Wang earned his Bachelor's of Arts degree in Chinese language and literature from Shanghai Normal University in 2008, his Master of Arts in Education from the University of Pacific, California in 2013, and his second Master's of Arts in Education with a major in teaching Chinese as a foreign language in 2018. Mr. Wong was nominated for a shining star by an MPS parent. Among their comments were the following. Mr. Wong has taken considerable time to make sure to communicate with families about the Chinese Mandarin curriculum. He is infus infusing our children with not only the language but the culture. His love for a subject is demonstrated by his many forms of communication. He often emails families with pictures and videos of the students participating in songs and lessons about the culture. Woodcrest has many piece visible pieces of information exposing all the students and visitors to Chinese symbols and or words. My child often practices lessons at home and seems to genuinely enjoy the subject. It is obvious that Mr. Wong is teaching in a way that our students feel confident using the lesson and language outside the cl classroom. Congratulations, Jing Chang. Thank you so much. If you haven't had a chance to see him teach, we have a video of him on our website you may want to see because it's pretty special on what he's done there. So great job. Our second is Megan Feist. If Megan is here, she's behind me. You can join me, Megan. Another uh, outstanding shining star. Megan joined the MPS staff in December of 2017 as an office professional in the HR department, beginning her day at 6 a.m. as our subcaller. In 2018, she was promoted to the administrative assistant in our HR department the position she continues to hold today. Megan has an associate's degree from Mid-Michigan Community College. Megan was nominated for a shining star by an MPS colleague. Among his comments were the following. Megan works tirelessly to promote a positive culture and provide exemplary customer service to all MPS stakeholders. 
During a time of transition within the HR department, Megan has been a source of stability, compassion, and has continued to perform beyond expectations. She exemplifies professionalism and is a key asset in the operations of our organization. She is highly deserving of praise and thanks from our team for all that she has done for Midland Public Schools. Congratulations, Megan. Our second presentation tonight, I'll let uh, Mr. Penix and Dr. Lipset introduce who they brought with them tonight. Well, I'm Linda Lipset, Principal at Adams, and I'm going to start us off this evening. We're very excited to be able to talk to you this evening. In the past, we've shared many components about the PYP journey, how it began, how it's impacted our students' critical thinking, the importance of the learner profile in supporting our school and developing students who appreciate diversity and respect the views of others. And we've had students share about how their work in the classroom has changed through this shift in instructional practice. We have not, however, talked much about the planning that goes into creating these amazing learning experiences for our students. The teachers make it look so seamless that if one wasn't aware of the ongoing development, review, and modifications each unit of inquiry takes, you would think it flows the same from year to year. We're now five years into our journey and continually growing in our practices. It's a process that is never done, which is unlike a lot of the things that we do when we're creating plans in education, nor is there a manual that tells you exactly what a PYP school looks like. In fact, the wonderful part about it is while we all enjoy that process at our elementaries, they look different. Um, Tonight, we'd like to share a bit more in depth about the construction of that unit planner and how this artful process has shifted not only how our learners learn, but how our teachers teach. Robin Harshman Rogers is the PYP coordinator at both Adams and Woodcrest. She's going to share about her work with our staff, Kara Stark, who's a third grade teacher at Adams, and Dominique Ensley, who's a first grade teacher at Woodcrest, are also with us this evening and will share their reflections on their work in developing the planners. Jeff Penix, Principal at Woodcrest, will then conclude our presentation and provide time for questions. So please join me welcoming Robin Harshman Rogers to share about the process of constructing the PYP. Good evening. Um, it's taken us six years to kind of find an analogy that would work to how we work with the PYP and construct our planners, but I think this is um, a way that connects to everyone. In the PYP, we believe that student learning is best done when it's authentic and connected to the real world. So to do that, we created a visual to provide you with a real world connection to how we create planners. So we're using the steps in building a house as a way to frame the process. Something that we all have a little prior knowledge about, especially in the Midland Public Schools elementary buildings in the last several years. So in teaching, as in construction, there is both a science and an art. As we outline the process, it's our hope that this analogy will provide a deeper understanding of what teaching and learning looks like within our elementary, elementary classrooms. So as IB World Schools, we share a common vision for developing internationally minded young people. The learner profile and its 10 attributes lie at the center of this mission, and we say it's the heart of the PYP. We provide opportunities for students to develop their natural curiosity and apply critical thinking skills in an ever-changing world. Ultimately, we encourage students to appreciate diversity and perspectives of others on their journey to becoming knowledgeable and caring citizens of the world. The learner profile at its core is what makes our house truly a home, and it's what makes learning come to life in our schools. So where do we start? We start with building codes. As IB PYP World Schools, we begin with the IB program standards and practices. The standards and practices serve as criteria to ensure quality and fidelity in the implementation of the PYP. We are always working to develop these standards and practices which are used to measure the success of our program. These standards work in the same way that building codes ensure quality and craftsmanship throughout a construction process. 
The PYP framework allows for the use of a wide variety of teaching strategies and styles that are driven by a spirit, spirit of inquiry and a clear purpose. One of the greatest strengths of the PYP is that it provides a process for ongoing reflection about our teaching practices individually, as a grade level team, and as an entire school. The PYP is based on the continuous improvement of teaching to improve student learning. The work that is required to build each planner is what offers teachers a sense of agency or ownership of their units of inquiry. This is why despite being an IB PYP district, no two planners will look the same despite delivering the same curriculum and standards. So in each grade level, every team creates six units of inquiry which are written, taught, and reflected each year. These six units at each grade level become our program of inquiry which consists of 36 unique and complex units per school. The program of inquiry is horizontally and vertically aligned and acts as a visual representation of the teaching and learning that takes place within a PYP school. All Midland Public Schools is an IB PYP district. Each program of inquiry, or POI, we have a lot of acronyms, is unique to the individual school, its culture, and its members. This is just as each house is unique to a given architect, a builder, but it yet still fits into a neighborhood. So, we begin the process with the end in mind. Each builder and his or her crew must have a vision of what the end product should look like. This model allows the crew to construct each part of the house step by step. In the same way, grade level teams work from the understanding of where each student should arrive in terms of their learning by the end of a unit of inquiry, as well as how that fits into the entire program of inquiry. This is known as a backwards design model, which is built with keeping the end in mind throughout the entire process. So constructing each planner takes a team as does building a house. The PYP coordinator acts as a four person overseeing and guiding the construction of each unit of inquiry as well as the entire program of inquiry. The teachers at each grade level are the experts in their curriculum and the masters of their classrooms. Together, we work collaboratively and draw upon our individual strengths while building a collective ownership of our units of inquiry. As in any process that builds or creates a product, collaborative time is essential. All team members need to be present to have a successful build. We presently meet as an entire team every other week during a common planning block that ranges in time from 45 to 60 minutes. In this time, we develop, construct, reflect and refine each unit of inquiry and its planner and we do that six times so just as builders use a blueprint to plan and construct a house we use a unit of inquiry planner to act as our blueprint as we construct each unit the PYP unit planner is a living document it provides a step-by-step -step process for planning writing teaching and reflecting on all of the components within a given unit of inquiry so we handed you some materials this evening. In there, there was a copy of a blank planner template. That's what we all face at the beginning of this. Um, and now, we also included two sample planners that are from this current school year. And in a few minutes, two teachers are going to talk about how this process has changed their teaching and student learning. So once we do have that blueprint, just as in building, we begin to build a foundation. In order to create the foundation, we must consider the grade level curriculum based on our content standards. We also must determine how each unit fits into one of our six PYP transdisciplinary themes. These themes are based on our common humanity and help students gain a, gain a local and global perspective on learning and its application to their lives. Themes such as how we organize ourselves, who we are, and how we express ourselves serve as a context for students to develop content, knowledge, and skills. After the foundation, the framing is next. For the planner, we be begin with a conceptually strong and universal central idea that invites challenging, relevant, significant, and engaging, engaging learning experiences for students. Central ideas such as systems provide a way for us to organize information, 
or exploration can lead to new discoveries are broad, big ideas that allow for connections across content areas, between grade levels, and beyond the classroom. So once we have our framing, we move on to our walls. The lines of inquiry on a PYP planner act as those walls and clarify the central idea, focus student inquiries, and help deepen understanding of content and concepts. Lines of inquiry are written in a way that allows students to make meaning that is connected to the central idea and the foundation or the theme of that unit. After the walls are constructed, the rooms begin to take shape. The rooms are learning experiences that are designed around best teaching practices and are created for student engagement, critical thinking, and application. These learning experiences are designed to deepen students' understanding of the theme, the central idea, and the lines of inquiry. You kind of hear those words a lot. We have a lot of words. Traditionally, these learning experiences are the daily activities taking place within a classroom. So, we also have inspections or assessments embedded within our units of inquiry. It's important for us to have a clear picture of what students know, what they understand, and what they can do throughout the unit. We are always monitoring, documenting, and measuring student learning and planning next steps. This is in the same way that a builder has inspections that are used to assess progress and test the quality of the construction along the way. Once that planner is constructed, it's time to put it into action and the teaching begins. Similarly, once a house is complete, it's time for its occupants to start living in it. In both situations, it's an ever-changing and fluid process. Much like a builder who has completed his or her house, there is a time for reflection about the process and the product. After the planner construction is complete and the planner has been taught, each grade level team must reflect on the unit. This reflection is completed collaboratively with the PYP coordinator and relies on the contribution of all members of the teaching team. Reflection for both teachers and builders results in some level of changes. So we've decided to try to explain that in two ways. So once your house is finished, you may have to redecorate. Reflection can result in simple changes like adding a new piece of furniture, painting a wall, or rearranging a living space in a house. In a unit of inquiry, this redecorating could be the addition of a new resource, a guest speaker, a new use of technology, or the altering of a learning experience. Or you might have a renovation. The reflection can result in a much larger project. In a house, this could be a kitchen remodel, a major repair due to a broken pipe, or a new addition. In a planner, this bigger remodel can occur when there is a change in curriculum, standards, or the adoption of a new program. This year has been filled with lots of renovations due to the addition of Project Lead the Way in all grade levels, as well as significant social studies changes in third and fourth grades. Yeah, wow. <laughs> So hopefully that gave you an overview of what a little bit what the process is like. It's really hard work, but it's very rewarding. And I would like to introduce two teachers who can kind of speak about what that's like from the other side. Um, I have Kara Stark, who teaches third grade at Adams, and Dominique Ensley, who teaches first grade at Woodcrest. So each week, or each on average twice a month, we meet for about an hour block of time. This team includes Robin, our PYP coordinator, and our grade level team. During this collaborative planning time, it is important that we are constructing and revising our PYP planners. The collaborative time is vital to the growth and development of each unit. Each team relies on strengths and talents of each member. Just like construction, though, our collaborative time can be interrupted or impacted due to schedule changes, weather days, lots of them this year, um, student needs, and resources. There are many hours beyond that two-hour times that we're allotted um, to ensure that we are um, creating rich and engaging units of inquiry. 
One of the positives of PYP is that we have a common language and structure across all grade levels and throughout each classroom in elementary. The structure allows us to write, teach, and reflect upon each unit of inquiry with our grade level team. The planner template provides the framework for guiding all teaching and learning. However, the common language and structure takes time to understand and develop. Based on the PYP framework and planning process, it allows us to guide our student thinking. Within the classroom, we create and post evidence of student thinking and learning. These visual markers include unit of inquiry boards, wonder walls, and other essential elements of the PYP. So thinking, oh, thinking about PYP in our classrooms as educators, we have encountered many shifts in our own teaching and our own personal learning. So this is currently my fifth year teaching at Woodcrest Elementary, and my fifth year teaching. Um, and I joined the staff when we were beginning the authorization process um, for PYP. In my experience, I have noticed that creating learning experiences with a child in mind is essential to how we teach PYP. So it will not be um, the same come year to year depending on your group. Student talk and questioning are both developed through student-centered and inquiry-based learning. We encourage students to explore their wonderings and deepen their understanding of con concepts and content. As facilitators, it is so important that we set aside time daily and that we are flexible within our school day. There are many times when student action, questioning, and inquiry guide our teaching rather than a predetermined schedule. When it comes to the PYP, it's not just teaching the standards. It's way deeper while promoting a more global understanding. We create authentic learning experiences that connect students to the world around them, both locally and globally. So rather than being the teacher that will feed the information, we are actually more of a facilitator of learning. We're taking their interest um, and their inquiries and wonderings and their prior knowledge and actually facilitating our units to fit those needs of our students. So allowing our students to drive our units of inquiry through student talk and questioning provides an opportunity for students to have ownership of their learning. So classrooms now will look differently and sound differently you know, from our traditional classroom of just sitting in rows and hearing pencils drop and all of that is completely different. I like to call it organized chaos um, because it's flexible groups, but the kids are engaged. They're having conversations about what we're doing and they are very act they're extremely engaged in their learning and they're very active. The ultimate goal in using P the PYP planner to design our learning is to have students take action based on what they have learned throughout the unit of inquiry. Both big and small actions are celebrated. Examples range from students cleaning up the playground to raising awareness about local and global issues. This is the animal activist group from Adams Elementary, a group of third graders, and they brought, um, they wanted to take action by saving animals. So what started as saving animals with posters around the building, uh, they then wanted to raise money and awareness for the local humane society. They did that and a check was presented during a presentation at Adams Elementary for all third grade classes. They continued um, to be animal activists by sharing announcements on um, Friday mornings about um, rare animals that are endangered, such as a pangolin, which quite frankly, I had no idea what that was. <laughs> so. And this past December, um, our first grade team taught a unit centered about around um, celebrations and traditions. During this unit, we um, shared and discussed intergenerational relationships through read alouds. Um, through the reading and discussion of these stories, students noticed that some elderly people rarely have visits from family or friends, especially during the holiday season. Through questioning, students developed their first idea of taking action. They wanted to create holiday cards. My first graders initiated this action and took great pride in this activity. Through further discussion, though, the students wanted to take a more profound action, which is wanting to build a, community, a retirement community center here in Midland, Michigan. The students wanted to sing songs and deliver the cards in person. We planned to visit a retirement community and had a great turnout for an evening event. This event was so successful that we have decided to make it a first grade tradition. <laughs> While thinking about PYP and student action, it is up to all of us, our grade level team, PYP coordinator, and our community to create opportunities for our students to put their ideas into action. So now thinking about the redecorating and the renovating, um, 
uh, right now, um, the planners can always take us to um, states. They can either be um, a re redecoration or a full renovation. Currently, our first grade team is teaching the unit of how we express ourselves. And we are redecorating with our Project Lead the Way science module of animated storytelling, which is computer coding. <laughs> Um, the central idea is now people use creativity to express ideas. We had revised that previously from authors and illustrators use creativity to allow us to have a bigger, more broader um, population and this will allow us to include computer coding. Third grade has had to renovate all of our planners this year due to content and curriculum shifts. Our third grade How We Organize Ourselves planner needed a complete renovation due to implement, implementing Project Lead the Way and the realignment of the third and fourth grade social studies standards. Our original central idea of location affects how and where people organize communities shifted to systems are created to organize information. The renovation of the central idea led to a broader, more concept-based framework for the unit. Exploring the concept of systems rather than location within a community allowed for the learning to be more transdisciplinary. The renovation included new lines of inquiry, assessments, and learning experiences. Similar to renovating a house, there are challenges when reconstructing a planner. The biggest challenge is time. Time with your team, the coordinator, and the time to implement and refine the learning. Another challenge is having to live in the renovation while it's taking place, which means teaching the unit while you are constructing it. So we have now shared our view from the classroom, and Jeff Penix will talk about shifts from the principal's perspective. Well, one of our major goals uh, this evening was just really to uh, increase awareness uh, regarding just the work that goes into uh, putting the planners together and how they are so very different from uh, the learning experiences that we would have experienced as, as kids uh, decades ago. Because I'm sure we're all familiar with the proverbial teacher's manual um, and kind of going page by page where many things are scripted. And as you can see and, and you saw from the presentation, um, this is a very active process where the teachers are heavily uh, involved in collaborating uh, with each other. Uh, one of the things that I've characterized uh, um, throughout the, the PYP process is before PYP, um, to use one of our acronyms, we had our GLICs, which uh, were grade level content expectations from the state. And of course, you'd have those from your different uh, subject areas. And you'd have binders, of course. And the binders then were all coded with you know subsections and so on. <clears throat> And I would say back then, um, the bulk of our time was discussing what to teach because you had a laundry list of things to cover under your weather unit or magnetism unit or whatever the case may be. And now, uh, thanks to PYP, uh, we've gone from just what to teach to what and how to teach it. Um, and, and although what that may sound like a rather simple transformation, I think, as you probably saw here, it is uh, a real game changer uh, when they're collaborating and talking about how to, to teach these concepts and what their big ideas are, what the enduring understandings are, and so on. Because there are discussions such as how to launch the unit, um, how to build toward enduring understandings, how to assess along the way. And once again, the grade level teams are coming up with those activities uh, themselves. Uh, and then, of course, what we will accept um, at the end as evidence of learning. Um, and like I said, it's a real transformation. And you, as you saw from our construction team here, to stick with that theme, um, they've really uh, done a very, very good job. It's very labor intensive. Robin, in our instance, has done a very good job um, of kind of conducting the orchestra. Uh, and it's really, like I said, been a game changer for us um, as educators ourselves. Uh, very, very uh, labor intensive. Uh, but once again, uh, producing, uh, we think, uh, uh, much improved results as compared to the past. So that's our presentation for this evening, and certainly we would entertain any, any questions that you may have. Oh, absolutely. I'll open it up to the board uh, for any questions. Just a few comments. It's, you did a great job, Robin, of presenting it by a house, because having been through this with all of you over the years as you've designed this, it really put it... It really explained it well. And the rest of you, too, um, the teachers, I applaud you because it's hard enough to be a teacher and then to change it. And like you said, midstream and, and when curriculum changes. And 
I know from my perspective, from what I've done and, and been in the classrooms and in the schools, you just it's a whole different feel even in the building. You know, what you have on bulletin boards and uh, the way kids are learning and everything is so interconnected. I think we're doing, you're doing a great job and I'm, I'm proud that we're doing this. So I think our kids are going to really um, show some positive, positive outcomes. Thank you, Lynn. Mm -hmm. I think we've seen a lot of positive outcomes just over the years watching. You know, we've had the privilege to sit and watch presentations and the experiences that the kids have gone through globally and locally. And it was nice to see kind of all the background work that and the countless hours that you guys have put in. Uh, one of the things that um, I always enjoy about the presentations is, is hearing and asking about the, uh, the most rewarding experiences that, that the kids kind of go through as they move through this process. So I wonder if, if we may get the same response from any of you um, about what has been most rewarding about building this house or this system um, in dealing with the kids and how things have changed. Um, I think the most rewarding thing for me personally is just to see the excitement with the kids. I mean, they're always excited about what's our new unit of inquiry and what are we going to be learning about and, you know, really trying to like develop those connections and things like that. And then also just their questioning. I think it's a lot deeper. Um, I've had a new student actually move from another state that's come to our PYP IB school and the open-ended concept is really new to her and they, and those kids kind of stand out a little bit. So I think we kind of were opening up their minds and knowing that there isn't a right answer or a wrong answer and we're going to lead them the right way I guess if there is misconceptions and I would just say I think that the students taking ownership in their learning has been phenomenal to see that they're excited to learn and inquire about things and then also when they take action they're so proud of themselves because they've used what they've learned throughout that unit of inquiry and are able to actually make it come to life whether it's locally or just within our school or globally. So. And I would speak a little bit to starting the process when we first went to our first training and they were talking about planners and things that we had no knowledge. I really could use that house analogy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there is no binder that tells you to do this th now and add this here. So it's really a growing and a process of discovery. And one of the questions I know that we asked was why, what, what makes the PYP so school so special? And it's really hard to articulate into words and they just said I would never teach anywhere else and I understand that now because of the process and how much ownership you take in creating something from nothing and having those transdisciplinary themes that connect everything together it's really a rich wonderful experience for students and encouraging them to have a voice and appreciate others and be accepting and tolerant and all of those things that embody the learner profile. So it's, it's a really magical thing to be a part of. I just wanted to share too that I think at, at, the, at the building level, it's changed the way that we work together as a community and as a teaching staff and really um, shifted away from lower L versus upper L versus grade level. It's a lot of having common, dis common language that was spoken about earlier, but being able to connect and really empathize and work together and, and help each other grow regardless of the grade level you're doing. So that whole uh, community, just it's vibrant and exciting. And I was also going to add, I love <laughs> the reflecting process because actually being able to sit down with your grade level team and saying what worked well, what didn't work well, what can we change, I think that that whole revising process is the most powerful part of it. Um, because normally we kind of throw it in the back of the binder like, oh, we'll get to that next year. And, you know, we're actually having, as soon as we teach the planner, we're revising it and we're reflecting on it and saying what went well, what do we need to change, and we're making notes for the next year or even changing them on the spot. I would, would just add, I think um, in education, what our biggest enemy is, is the clock. Um, and um, with the focus on enduring understandings um, and with so much to cover, uh, with this process, I'm confident that we could give students assessments probably uh, months after the, we originally covered the topic. And because those enduring understandings and learning connections were actually made in meaningful ways, I'm confident that they would still do quite well. 
we're back once again. Uh, Pre-PYP, where the focus, uh, you might say, was largely on vocabulary terms and, and things of that nature. And we've all experienced it ourselves as learners. Um, you know, we would learn it for the test. And I'm not sure we would want to take that same test uh, three or four months later, where as with this uh, way of doing it, once again, with those learning connections that were made, uh, I, I think the, the kids would, would do quite well. I just wanted to say I, I love the analogy. I thought it was really, really good. I think you should take your show on the road, you know, and go, go do the IB training for PYP and uh, present it that way. Thank you very much. And I also would like to invite you to an open house, which is every day of the year. We have 72 houses oh, wow. that are in a different states of redecorating or renovating. And maybe now that you have this little different perspective when you walk into a room, there are things that you will notice um, based on how we tried to visualize it for you. So you are always welcome. Thank you, and thank you for giving us a great perspective of the design and, and what's all involved in this. We've been hearing about PYP for a long time, and I've been a fan from the start, and I know it's such a scientific evidence-based program, and um, the learner profiles are just a fabulous way for our students to start, and the inquiry is just a, a wonderful way to learn, and just so much evidence behind that being a, a a way to learn that would that we can retain longer so I'm thankful for the staff and for for all the work that you've done to put this together but I'm really thankful as well to the foundations that allowed us to invest in this so that our community could benefit from something as wonderful as PYP it's it's a, a real gem and it's fun to hear all about it so thank you for coming into item 3.3, .3, which is uh, Inclusion and Diversity Update. Mr. Sherrill. So I thought it was pretty vital that we, um, <clears throat> with, uh, before you take action on item 3.5, that we give you a little update on the other portion of that, which is Inclusion and Diversity. And I, I think to give you an update, I have to go back about a year and a half ago, um, after we had another whole high-profile incident. Um, a casual conversation with Rob Valentine turned into much more. And so uh, Rob and I had actually ran at each other in Cadoba, and uh, we started talking. And he said, how did it go? And he's a great supporter, as you know, of the school system. And I said, well, we're kind of struggling a little bit. And, um, you know, I see Dow has an inclusion and diversity office, and maybe you could provide some assistance um, and some help with that. And, of course, Rob did. And I think Amy and I were talking the other day. A couple days later, a week or two later, I got an invite from Dow. That wasn't accidental. Um, and we were, we were off to Washington, D.C. with a group of leaders um, going to the African American Museum and taking that time to meet and discuss how the community may address inclusion and diversity going forward. Um, and from there, um, Rob and was and Amy was conscious enough to um, offer some training. And so last August, we carved out our first day of training where we brought all of our staff to introduce them a little bit to inclusion and diversity. I think we kind of did a little unconscious bias training that day, but it was really, um, I think it was a little bit to get staff fired up about that piece of it. And from there, we offered um, staff to apply to become an inclusion and diversity leader in the district. Um, our target was to potentially get one from every building, which we did. We had plenty of applicants to look at. Um, I think between the inclusion office at Down ourselves, we went through some and we chose um, somewhere between 12 and 14 people who, Pam was actually one who represented the board, who went to, um, at that time, New York, to the WE Day, which was sponsored by Dow. And while they were there learning about WE, which like IBPYP kind of fits into this topic, I think. We heard a lot of words there, mm -hmm. I think, that fit into that piece of it. Um, they began to explore maybe um, an inclusion diversity strategic plan for the district in, in the early stages of all of that. And it kind of takes us up to um, some of our more recent events that we've had. And so um, 
the, the team has been working with Dr. Beasley, but also Leanne Rouse Keller, who all of you know from her time on the board, um, but she's been assisting the team on um, beginning that process of going down forward. Um, this Thursday, Penny, they have a meet, one, another one of their meetings uh, to begin to continue to work down that piece of it. So it's really um, the early stages of working on some of those pieces as we go forward. Um, it's really a team approach as well. We're, we're reaching out to other um, experts in the field if there's such a thing. Um, I know Purdue University has a, a division of that. We've looked at that recently. Uh, Mark Hackbarth, I don't know if Mark's here tonight, he's reached out to MEA, and uh, MEA is, we're going to read, uh, meet a gal from MEA who has um, worked with many school districts on this type, type of to topic in the, their districts and so we hope that may um, bear some fruit as we go forward. Uh, you know we've shared a little bit um, Bob Cooper from his years in the district knew that the district had taken on this topic inclusion before and it really was wrapped around special education um, a number of years ago and they gave some mini grants <clears throat> to work on the inclusion of special ed needs students into the classroom and so we were taking that topic and said uh, maybe we can give our teachers an opportunity to do some inclusion efforts in their class or maybe a building district-wide and support that as well financially. And the last thing I would add is um, our state school board, if you have not noticed that, has taken some action on this as well. They've created some, a resolution they call Dignity in Schools. And so um, that resolution is something that we're going to study and follow as well, which may give us some guidance uh, and how the state board expects districts maybe to take on this topic. And um, the last piece I'll close on that is just that, you know, when the state school board's taken on this issue, it, uh, it's a societal issue that's bearing into all of the school districts as well as communities that we have out there. And so it's a challenge lying ahead. I'm, I don't pretend to be an expert in inclusion and diversity, and so we're reaching out for some of those pieces and trying to move forward from not only this incident, but multiple incidents that we've had at this point in time. And so hopefully that plays into your decision a little bit when you do have to take the tough action that you're going to have to take later in the meeting today. So anything you want to add, Penny? So Penny's kind of leading that charge for us a little bit amongst all, all of her other duties as well. So. All right, very good. Thank you for that update. Appreciate it. All right, then we will move into item 3.4, which is for action. It's a student uh, reinstatement. Mr. Bruton? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, for student A reinstatement, item 3-4, a board subcommittee met on March 11th in regard to student A who applied for reinstatement to the Midland Public Schools. After consideration of the seven factors required by statute, the committee recommends that student A be conditionally reinstated based on satisfying each of the criteria. A copy of the full resolution is attached to this board agenda. Very good. Thank you. At this time, I'll entertain a motion for item 3.4, student reinstatement for conditionally reinstating student A. So moved. Second. Moved by Friedel, support by McFarland. Um, is there any comments or discussion? I just to add, we, we can't identify the students on these actions under privacy rights, so. Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move into vote. All in favor of voting for student A reinstatement, item 3.4, say aye. 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 All opposed? And it passes unanimously. We'll move into item 3.4, which is for action, student B expulsion. Mr. Bruton? Yes, ma'am. Um, a board subcommittee met on March 11th in regard to student B, who's being recommended for expulsion. After consideration of the seven factors required by statute, the committee recommends that student B serve the expulsion based on the seriousness of the behavior, the safety risk posed by the behavior, and the age of the student. The recommendation includes that student B can petition for reinstatement uh, for the 2019-20 school year and that the student be presented the opportunity for off-site academic services by a certified teacher during the expulsion. A copy of the full resolution is attached to this board agenda. Very good. At this time, I'll entertain a motion for uh, student B, expulsion. So moved. Second. Moved by McFarland, uh, seconded by uh, Roche. And I'll open it up for discussion or comment. With the people that are present here today that are asking to address the board, um, 
We cannot speak of an individual, we cannot speak of names, but are, are these relative to this matter or direct to this matter, or are they inclusion and diversity as standalone comments? Because if we have public people that are want to be heard, are we going to hear them after we vote on student B? Uh, this is a, the board meeting is for the board, mm -hmm. and it's a public meeting, and the public is invited to be, okay. to watch, but it is not a participatory board meeting where, where they would have input into the board meeting. Uh, we always allow an opportunity for public to have uh, comments at the meeting, but in no way is that supposed to be a part of the decision-making process. The, the hearing on the expulsion has already occurred, so this is just an action by you. Um, and, and anyone who has signed up, I think it is more about inclusion to diversity efforts than it is about the actual um, discipline of, this, of, a, of a student. That helps. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to ask the question. Okay, any other comments or discussion? Seeing none, we'll move into a vote. So all those in favor of the student expulsion for student B, say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. And it passes with five ayes and one opposed. Six. Six, Six, Six. ayes and one opposed. All right, we'll move into item 3.6, which is for action, 2019-20 school year calendar. Mr. Sherrill? We are recommending a board approval for the 2019-20 calendar, which we reached a gr agreement with with the Midland City Education Association. <clears throat> the parameters of that calendar is that we start school on Tuesday, September 3, and we end on June 11th without any snow makeup days, maybe. And um, um, that will provide for the 180 days of instruction that we're supposed to reach as well. Very good. At this time, I'll entertain a motion for item 3.6, the 2019-20 school year calendar. So moved. Second. Moved by Fridell, support by Roush. Open for discussion. Any discussion? No discussion. Okay, we'll move into a vote then. Uh, all in favor of approving the school year calendar, 2019-20 school year calendar, say aye. 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 All opposed? And it passes unanimously. We move into item 3.7, which is for action, the CNC router for Midland High. Mr. Cooper? Yeah, this is uh, kind of an interesting purchase. Uh, as a district, we purchase it, but it, we're reimbursed by the Midland County ESA through uh, statewide CTE 61C funds. So um, it's a, uh, a router, computer-assisted router. Uh, you'll see that we're recommending the Luna Tools of Urban California for a total price of 28 thousand eight hundred eighteen dollars and forty six cents um, that's a upgrade over their bid if you were looking at the bid tab um, the difference between a liquid cool spindle and a, a, a free air cooled spindle I could act like I know the real difference in that but it was explained to me as the maintenance involved in those two and that the uh, free air was the way to go um, it's not necessarily the low bidder but as you see the low bidder did not submit the complete bid packet and couldn't meet uh, any of the delivery deadlines, uh, etc. So, again, this is uh, an item that will go into our um, career tech building uh, program and uh, be used by students um, a little larger than typically what we've been spending our 61C money on. Very good, thank you. So, at this time, I'll entertain a motion for item 3.7 the CNC router for Midland High. So moved. Support. Moved by Roush, support by McFarland, and we'll open it for discussion. Excited to get a new router. I'm sure the, the <laughs> yeah, Midland High is excited, excited to cut some metal and uh, make some great, great things over there. It's always great to um, have high quality equipment for our CTE programs, so I'm sure that will be appreciated. Okay, so we'll move into a vote. All in favor of approving item 3.7, the CNC router for Midland High, say aye. 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 All opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll move into item 3.8 for action, which is a high school concrete uh, using bond funds. Mr. Cooper? 
If you remember, it's been a while, but back in December we did a bid package for summer work, uh, 18102, and at that time we decided we wanted to re-examine the scope of the work involving concrete replacement at the two high schools. Um, upon doing that and going back with everybody and looking at it, the project at Middle High really didn't change at all. Uh, the HH Dow one, they reduced the scope of work, so they bid it out. Uh, same person got the bid that had it originally. Um, the scope of work, it basically Dow, the difference was there was some areas of work where they wanted to avoid so that we weren't doing things twice. There was excess concrete in different places, I just think through the years to a piece of concrete down someplace, and that was there. And there were pieces that did not need to be replaced. So that relook at that saved us uh, 142823 from that original bid. We're recommending the award to Tri-City Groundbreakers of Midland, Michigan for a total of 488527 for the concrete work that we'll do this summer at the two high schools. Very good. Thank you. This time I'll entertain a motion for item 3.8 high school concrete using bond funds going to Tri-City ground breakers for 100 uh, I'm sorry for four hundred eighty eight thousand five hundred twenty seven dollars so moved support moved by Fredell support by Baker and we'll open up for discussion the the part that was del that will be delayed because they may have to do work around it that will be added on then later at a, a if it's not a piece that doesn't need to be replaced at all that's that's true there were just some spots um, a lot of the steps and the planners that go around there that to do concrete work right there now with changes coming doesn't make yeah didn't make sense I just wanted to be clear all right if there's no other discussion we'll move into a vote all in favor of approving of approving item 3.8 high school concrete using bond funds going to tri-city ground breakers say aye. aye aye all opposed and it passes unanimously item 3.9 for action we have the 2018-19 budget adjustment mr cooper yep we just give us one second here and we'll have it set up for you All right, like, uh, like we do, in fact, I'm going to jump to the next slide here because that's really where we want to start. Um, it's getting to that time of year again where we do the budgets. Um, this case, the, uh, we're at the mid-year budget adjustment. If you remember, school budget's not advisory in nature like you would see in most businesses. It's really an accounting of the public funds. Uh, sources where it's coming from and how we're spending it and using it. So when there are changes, which there typically are in a school year because of the time we adopt and to the finish, um, you do a budget adjustment. We typically do two of those, one in March or February, depending on where we're at, and the last one in June, just before or at the same time that you're adopting the new budget. So have got the timeline here in front of you. You can kind of see where we'll be. We'll do the budget workshop on the 15th, the next board meeting, uh, typically half an hour before. Um, could be a little different this year. We usually give you some of the factors that are going to affect the budget. Um, while the governor's proposal is out there, it's got some... A rather drastic changes and that's a okay thing but uh, we might not be as far in the process to give you as much detail without the house and senate versions there mm -hmm. so we'll at least have some piece of information but it might not be as much as we've had in other years um, then on june 10th and that's why we have two budget meetings in june june 10th we'll give you the actual budget for 1920 and that's the technically the public hearing at that point and then on that last board meeting, you have to do two things. You have to do the last amendment, adoption, changes, revisions to the 1819 budget, and then you adopt the 1920 budget at that point in time. So that's the kind of timeline we'll follow over the next, you know, three months, four months as we go. All right. Well, typically we have some major factors that cause some kind of budget adjustment to happen. Um, these are very typical. You hear me, I know it sounds a little bit like a broken record, but these are the things when you're putting a budget together in June you don't have a total handle on. One is always the student enrollment. When they're funding it by a foundation grant, how many students you have can make quite a difference. Um, we budgeted for 7634, and the blended count varies by a student or two each month, but it's been around 7689, so we're about 60 above that, which is always a good thing. We try to budget conservatively, um, you know, through the years, and I show you that usually when I do the final budget, but that, that enrollment's gone 
you know, and it wasn't a downward trend. It's been pretty uh, flat or stable um, the last four or five years. Um, also, the volatility and timing in the state funding. Sometimes we're putting together a budget and we don't have the final numbers. In this case, it wasn't off by much, but there was a $5 difference in the student foundation allowance, $5 more. Um, we always have local revenue factors, though it's starting to stabilize there too, but as in a town like Midland, you get developmental zones and personal property taxes that are being uh, brought in, brownfields, tax appeals. Sometimes and most times there's an offset in the state funding, but it can change your local. A uh, big issue, you'll see it quite a bit when you see the actual budget changes, is grant funding. More and more the state is making money available through grants. Typically grants are in and out. In other words, they have a purpose, they have to be spent on that, but it really changes your both your uh, expenditures and your revenue coming in. Um, changes in special services, including funding we get from the ESA. Um, typically that's because uh, with higher need students, the cost can vary greatly depending on on individual students as you have them in the program so you can get some differences there and of course we always have a budget variance at the end we like that you, you would always like to have that but you know do we spend the full amount that's been allocated and so that happens as we go so we still have a variance at the end the major revenue changes you'll see um, that additional students on this and as you look down through this um, any place you see a capital C after it um, that's those are grant funds that means that there's an uh, identical expenditure on the other side. So it looks like a lot of money coming in, but it's going right back out the side, which is good because it allows us to do other things. Um, but you start with, you know, the state and local funding changes. If you remember, the 147 monies are typically for the retirement system, uh, the state helping offset that rising retirement rates. Um, there's everything there. You'll notice like the safety grant, um, which was new this year and came later. If you remember, we added a great start readiness and additional seats as we did. Uh, we have at-risk carryover money. You can't always tell where you're going to be until the end of the year. And remember, you adopted a budget before you know how much is left before, the year before. Uh, another early literacy grants and federal grants. I got another sheet here, but the total revenue changes since the June adoption is about $2.3 million, as you can see at the bottom there. Um, just a couple other ones here, revenue changes. Uh, we did get a transfer, or we'll be getting a transfer from... Um, the ESA, uh, and it's called P18, but that's some of the special education money that they give us. Um, we did get an inclusion of diversity and WE grants, which are unusual to this year. And uh, as we've been telling FFO as we go, of course, we're pulling in more in interest rates because interest rates have been higher. Uh, that wasn't much of a topic I could bring to you in the past because the interest rates were so low, it didn't amount to a whole lot. But it's, you know, it's, um, it's not all-time highs or anything, but bringing more interest money in on our, on our money. Um, expenditures, again, expenses going out, you'll see at the bottom comes to about 2.9 or about 3. Um, we always have some non-budget expenses. Um, the biggest ones are what you see there. Um, if you remember, we're settling some of the employee uh, groups and they have had some um, bearing on this year's budget and the other part has been the transfers. We don't often think of that, but we've had to move money to the capital improvement funds, as you know. Um, everything, like, for example, that's where uh, the press box comes out of, but I'll give you two other recent examples, maybe three. Uh, elevator at Northeast. Um, if you were anywhere near Jefferson today, there's a little bit of a sinkhole that they've been tearing up and repairing there. And, and then we also had some um, pipe issues at Midland High that, uh, of course, they're never near the surface. They're always deep down, and, and it, you know, you have to go further to dig and cost you more money. So. Those are all things that have just come up as, as, again, as we've aged, and you knew that, the bond's going to take care of so much, but we're going to have some, some main issues just coming up, so it's important that we, that we keep that going. Mm -hmm. Most of the other things you're going to see are those grants funds that came in that will go back out again. So you're seeing kind of a, a matching as that goes. <coughs> I guess there's one other thing when we talk about non-budget expenses, too. Um, you got to remember a lot of the state funding, too, especially in the area of special education, and court ordered so like at the um, JCC um, they base the funding you get one year based on the year before and then they come back in the year after and they either give you more or they take more away so you can't always control that part it's uh, unknown as to where you'll be at the end so it's like a year later that you find those things out
Uh, again, this is just a couple more. Again, it's most of those things. The other thing that we did is uh, a STEM grant. Remember, we took in money uh, from the foundations, et cetera, for STEM. And we did spend an extra about 350 um, that wasn't in the original budget. Um, we did purchase a lot of materials for Project Lead the Way. Um, FFO will remember at the early part of the year. Um, that expenditure was high there. And, and we did buy a lot of the materials that we we're going to need going forward. So there's a little bit more there. And then the part that you typically are looking for um, kind of compares this one, the original June budget that we set. Um, I want to remind you on that budget that it was set before the audit and actually at the same time we were setting the budget for the following year. So those things always play a part in why there's some adjustments too as you look. But uh, in red is, is our adjusted amounts. So you see the difference in revenues up that 2.3 million I just showed you. You see the difference in expenditures, that's at 2.9 or about 3. Uh, of course, that's going to make the surplus, uh, the amount of money that your revenues exceed expenses, smaller. Um, the variance is staying about 1%. Remember, that's a conservative estimate. And typically, uh, we've been running uh, somewhere between 2 and 3. Um, but we want to do 1 because there have been years where that 1's a pretty good estimate and you don't really want to put your budget together without, without being there. So you can see the surplus. When you go down to the fund balance at the bottom, there's a couple things I wanted to mention to you. Uh, one is that um, when we anticipated in June where our budget would be in June of 19, that 18 uh, million and the 22.9, um, when it actually got audited, it was about, we started the year about 1.8 million higher than that. So the audit showed by the variance at the end of the year that we came in better than that. So you might say, boy, it looks like, you know, you, you had a few more expenditures than revenues. How can it grow? Um, that's because I started at a better number at the first part, mm -hmm. um, which gets adjusted in March. And that's one of the other things, as you recall, we're putting a budget together June 10th. Um, you're finishing off uh, the new budget uh, June 24th, and you're not getting your audit back till September, sometimes October. And so that amount just corrects itself when you find the final variances and what, what is and isn't or hasn't been spent. The other part is that expenditures at the bottom, the percent of expenditures, that's what I would call just a, um, a plain uh, percent. It does not take into account what has been um, uh, restricted, or in the case of the terms we're trying to use better now is assigned and unassigned. Um, so that's not what that percentage shows. That just shows what the total fund balance is. That includes money that's been gifted. Um, the number you're looking at here, it would include money that you've assigned. As you remember, we're siloing some money into funds, for example, for copiers or technology so that when we no longer have bond funds, we have a way to fund those. So just want you to keep that in mind when you see that. Um, the unassigned currently is more like you're running closer to 18 to 19 percent. I, I couldn't give you an exact number, so it's less than that because that percentage has been assigned in, in the, uh, but in the uh, fund balance itself. Um, lastly, as you look ahead, I uh, just want to keep always in your mind the key budget drivers that we have. Uh, we're doing our balance, our budget process as we speak. Uh, that's where the buildings come to us and they talk about their needs for the following year. Um, we know, and, and I'll tell you the same thing, you'll see it down below, uh, but we do know that as we go forward, um, we have some personnel costs that are going to be there because, you know, we went through a concessionary period of time and when you do better, our employees who are kind of the backbone of what we do, um, some of that money is going to go that way. And we've also had to put some money in that capital improvement fund, and we'll have to on a continuous basis as we go forward. Um, because, again, the, the bonds to do so much work, but we, you have the other issues that pop up that aren't always very uh, cheap that need to be fixed, but they need to be fixed. And, and you can recall that from, uh, be, oh, it's hard to believe, but a summer ago with the um, generator at uh, Dow High School. Uh, which came out, so that's there. But balance our budget, student enrollment, we're waiting for our consultant to get back with us. Um, state funding, like I said earlier, we got the initial um, request from, or we saw the initial uh, request from the governor. Uh, you always have personnel costs, and you know we're always going to be 85 to 86 percent in that. You would expect that because we're a people industry, so that's not anything that should be surprising to you. And then again, um, the transfers that we get from the ESA, remember that's where we get some of our special ed money, some of the federal IDA money, some of the billings for Medicare, and of course the enhancement millage. And some of that slightly different going forward because of what the enhancement millage the state now allows it to go towards. So 
there could be some changes there. So that's the uh, budget adjustment, if you will, and it requires you to um, uh, vote on that and accept that at tonight's meeting. And like I said, we would talk about next year's budget at the April meeting, and then by June, uh, we would be actually showing you the, the budget and giving you some of the background details that we have at that time. Great. Thanks, Bob. Yep. Pam, we typically on a budget, it's not required, but we typically take a roll call vote on this. All right. At this time, I'll uh, entertain a motion for item 3.9 for action, the 2018-19 budget adjustment. So moved. moved Support. By Support by Fidel, and we'll open it for discussion. I think it's it's um, great. I'm glad we are siloing dollars for copiers and expenses, roofs and and whatnot. I think that's a, a really important move and good to have in the in our budget. And um, the balance our budget process is a, a great one. You've been doing that for several years, and uh, it just has everybody as a piece of taking uh, ownership as to where we are in our our budget. And I, and I appreciate that effort by everyone as well. Um, I've been reading up about what's going on at the Capitol, and uh, I'm anxious to see what we see coming for the future with um, with school funding and taxes, and there's a lot of unknowns now, and uh, it looks like um, timing might be a little longer than we're used to, too, as far as when we find out uh, how much funding we get. Which is kind of scary. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so we'll move into a roll call vote. Could you do uh, Sure. President Singer. Aye. Vice President McFarland. Aye. Secretary Baker. Aye. Treasurer Fidel. Aye. And Member Blasey. Aye. Member Lauterbach. Aye. And Member Rausch. Aye. Seven ayes. Seven ayes. So it passes unanimously. And now we go to item four, which is request to address the board. At this, this time, anyone uh, who has concerns related to the operation of the schools or matters within the authority of the board uh, can participate. And uh, we have three people who have uh, signed up ahead of time, so we'll go in the order of those three folks. And then it'll be opened up for uh, anyone else who would like to address the board. When you come up to address the board, if you could state your name, your address, and um, your uh, group you're affiliated with, that would be wonderful. We also have a five-minute clock that keeps us on task, so we'll run the five-minute clock, and when the, the clock runs down, your time is up, and the next person can come forward. All right, it looks like Dr. Jennifer Vanette is first to request to address the board. that good? Mm -hmm. Jennifer Vinnett, 603 Coolidge Drive. We are burdened by our history of racial inequality and our relative silence about that. Because talking about race makes white people uncomfortable, we allow ourselves to ignore the reality that the entire history of the U.S. is built on the claim that black people are less than fully human, that they only count as three-fifths a person. Reconstruction was actually a time of great gains for, formerly for the formerly enslaved despite white attempts to stop progress. But that isn't how we typically teach it. The truth is ending Reconstruction. The growth of black codes, Jim Crow, vigilantism under white sheets was a backlash against black success and progress. It wasn't pure racism without reason. It was a system designed for oppression because without it black people did and could rise. The North practiced segregation too. We just hid it in policies, placing vice and pollution emitting industries next to black neighborhoods, combined with private housing covenants to restrict black mobility. Then because property values were depressed, we further cut city services, making it less desirable and less safe to live in black communities. 
African Americans were granted the right to vote only to have that right stripped through poll taxes, arbitrary tests, gun violence to scare them from the polls. The Voting Rights Act of 65 improved things so much that white people sued, and the Supreme Court eventually decided in Shelby v. Holder to roll back protections. And since the exact day of that decision, states have moved to place new barriers on voting, diminishing black voter turnout. Despite claiming neutrality and how new history is presented in schools, education is skewed towards whiteness. Our children learn about slavery, but they don't know the horrors of the lived experience. They learn that Dr. King had a dream, but we don't talk about the white men blowing up black Sunday school children in a church. Our students don't really learn about people of color as positive movers of knowledge and spirit. We don't teach in science classes that Percy Julian pioneered large-scale synthetic hormone production still used today, or that George Washington Carver revolutionized agriculture. He did more than grow peanuts. And we don't openly address the need for civil rights activism. We don't teach why Billie Holiday singing about strange fruit was so powerful, or the first surgeon to successfully perform open heart surgery was a black man named Daniel Hale Williams, and his patient lived another 50 years. And bear in mind, he did this with less equipment than white surgeons because he wasn't given admitting privileges in the white hospital. Accomplishment, despite diminishment, both are part of the story. In Michigan, we avoid that the founders of the state were slaveholders. We skip ahead to the state constitution when slavery was banned. We don't, dis uh, we don't discuss, despite abolitionist activity here, that we crafted policies to ensure racial segregation and intentionally held African Americans down economically. We don't teach why residents of Detroit rebelled in 43 and 67. We don't talk about how segregation led to a need for separate resort destinations. And still W.E.B. Du Bois, Charles Chestnut, and other intellectuals made this state a summer destination with their own resort at Idlewild with musical talent making it the summer Apollo of Michigan, or how another summer visitor was the first female self-made millionaire in the US. She was an African-American woman named Madam C.J. Walker who built a cosmetics empire. We expect black exceptionalism in our daily interactions, but at the same time deny the entire history of black accomplishment. James Baldwin explained white people learn a history that flatters us, that reinforces the idea of our superiority. He wrote, the white American remains proud of his history for which he does not wish to pay, and for which materially he has profited so much. Whose stories do we privilege and why? We continue to have racism in our schools because we aren't teaching that non-white people have made significant contributions to our world. The reality is our students of color are not shocked by racism, which means our students are old enough to learn the uncomfortable parts of history. Be certain it's only the white kids who avoid it. Reconciliation begins with telling the truth about who we are and why we created the institutions as we have. It's painful but important to confront. Attempts to silence the conversation and police what is said and who gets to say it also has a long dark history. We should be proactive, but when something does happen, our first reaction should be how is this a teachable moment, not how do we get people to be quiet or only say positive things. And that's all I can teach you in five minutes. Imagine what you could learn if you prioritize it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burnett. Uh, next, uh, Miss Amy Phoenix. Yeah, that's fine, Amy. Um, Pam, I think I learned you had, she wanted to uh, provide the, her address but not have it public. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Uh, my name is Amy Phoenix, and I was born and raised here in Midland, so I came through the school system here. And as I considered what I wanted to share with you, uh, the board and the community members that are listening, I had a lot of things swim through my mind, but again, there's five minutes. So um, what I'm really hoping to do is connect with the fact that we're all in this room because we care about children a lot. Mm -hmm. um, either we're educators or we're parents or we're caregivers in some way, and we want to help them recognize and anchor into their own potential and be able to live from that space inside themselves. And I want you to know that it does not matter how small of a group is affected how isolated an incident is. Um, we need a different approach and a different response to racial matters in this community. 
I've seen it since I was little. I'm 42. It's still very much the same as it, as it ever was. And as a mother of both biracial and Caucasian children, I have a really unique experience of how racism can impact a person, but I still don't know what it's like to actually be in the skin of someone who is constantly judged just because of the color of their skin or the broadness of their nose or whatever their character trait is that someone sees from the outside and judges them on, oftentimes unconscious bias, sometimes open bias. Our town is almost 90% white, last time I checked. Um, it's really easy for us here to not see this, these issues, these matters, as something that really does matter to everybody. It's hard for us to see the full impact of this. And it's not just the people of color who are affected and people who love them, but it's us because we're ignorant. And I mean that in the most respectful way. I'm saying it about myself as well. We just don't know. And what happens with that is that we have a lack of understanding and a lack of caring and a lack of ability to listen and actually be compassionate and take action on these matters in ways that will help people, including ourselves, the whole, all the people here and when we go out into other areas of the world and we're interacting with people. And we're a community that has power. We have this big organization, you know, company here and we have money and we say lovely things and we do a lot of lovely things here. And we can do more on these issues. We can have conversations. We can start to do things that make it comfortable for people to talk about race. But we have to be willing to do that. And we have to be willing to listen to people who are affected and have them at the table as part of these conversations. So along with um, asking you to do some things differently, I, I really want people who are affected to have a seat at the table. And I want to encourage people that are in positions of power to consider how you can personally and collectively do things to listen and include us. Include the people who are, are telling you that this matters to them and that it matters to everybody. Don't silence us when we tell you what's going on because it is impacting us and we, we're part of your community. That's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Phoenix. Ms. Jennifer Ringwald. Jennifer Ringwald, 2801 Highbrook Drive. I've spent the last five years learning parts of history and things about power and privilege that I never learned in school. I'm still learning, but at this point, I am able to better understand the difference between overt acts of racism against people of color and the more hidden institutionalized racism that is an integrated part of white society. Based on recent events in Midland Public Schools, this board will not have the luxury of lots of time to learn. As the leaders who run this institution, I implore you to take this opportunity to understand much more quickly that the overt racism that continues to present itself in our schools over and over is a result of an underlying problem stemming from deeper cultural and institutional issues. As elected leaders, you need to truly listen and hear what people of color in our community are trying to explain to you about all of this. But please understand, the responsibility should not have to fall on people of color to teach white people about racism. One of the most impactful quotes in my anti-racism journey thus far is from Robin DiAngelo, author of the book titled White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. She says racism is a white problem. It was constructed and created by white people, and the ultimate responsibility lies with white people. It's pretty awful to stand here in front of everyone and admit that talking about race is hard as a white person. White people don't practice talking about race because in white society, we don't have to. So it's uncomfortable. When faced with the topics of race, racism, and privilege, we as white people can often feel a range of emotions that include guilt, shame, anger, confusion, and defensiveness. So we avoid it. As white people, we must deal with these feelings and talk anyway. We can no longer allow white discomfort to be an excuse to perpetuate racism. We must create opportunities to discuss race, listen to people of color, and learn about race at every age, regardless of our white feelings, 
because we are witnessing what happens in our schools when we don't. This board has the honor to hear lived experiences from people, stud um, parents, students, and community members on a regular basis. I often attend board meetings and see presentations about things we can celebrate about MPS. Sometimes the board is addressed in a more critical way, designed to improve ref or to inspire reflection around areas where we as a district can improve. I am grateful for the others, individuals who are bravely here to share with you tonight about their lived experiences and suggestions for ways that we can improve. To open the door for working together regarding the challenges we are facing around race and racism, this is an opportunity for a compassionate response from you as leaders. Something like, I'm sorry that happened and I want to understand better. Your responses matter. Please know that while a leader may not intend to be racist, the impact of defensiveness or dismissal is. I encourage each of you to respond with something like, I'm sorry, and I want MPS to be better. Author and activist James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Midland Public Schools must face the systemic issues that have brought us all here. It is my hope and the hope of many people here tonight that as the people of power in this organization, you will be leaders who take this opportunity to begin to learn more deeply about race and lead by example. Truly listen to the lived experiences, have the hard conversations, seek out resources by people of color, attend the lectures designed to challenge you. Simultaneously, you must encourage and provide spaces for teachers and administrators to learn and help them truly teach and talk to our children about race. We must work together and begin to act now. This board must immediately find the time, the resources, and the heart to change our current systems that are perpetuating racism. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ringwald. Uh, would anyone else like to come speak? I, this, is, this is hard for me, so bear with me. Um, I am Ayana Haynes, a proud mother of four. My older two children graduated with honors from Midland High School. I currently have a senior at Midland High and a fourth grader at Central Park. Midland is a very good school system. Thanks to Midland Public School, my older children are excelling very well in college. Throughout the years, I told my kids to take one step at a time, to never give up, to dream big, to be part of the solution, and to celebrate today. It is very hard for children to celebrate when they had a rough day. I, rem I remember when my oldest son came home in tears because a classmate told him that he was dirty because he was brown. I remember when he was told that he could not go to a birthday party because brown people were not allowed in her home. When my daughter was told that her hair was weird and looking fuzzy, she asked me to make her hair straight and curly so she would not stand out. When my son was called a black fish in the halls of middle school and had to prove that he was being picked on, 
I remember when my daughter was told that slavery should still exist. When she was waiting for school to start, I had to be strong for my family during those times. I had to help them find their beauty. I had to teach them to stay focused on their classes. I had to teach them to look the other way. Sometimes the teachers and administration did not know what to say. I don't know if my kids really knew how to ask for help. What I do know is that they came home not celebrating that day. Who are we, Midland? Who are we? Are we going to embrace the change and treat everyone with respect? Or are we going, and are we going to treat everyone equally? Millen has to decide what we want to be. It's very hard for me to stand up here and ask for change because all of my kids have been change makers. But I know we can do it. I know we can do it together. I also have a house analogy that I would like to end with. I feel like Midland is a place that welcomes you into their home, but don't offer to take your coat, don't offer a drink of water or even a seat. All we want is to be heard as people of color. We deserve that, and that's all we want, and that's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Haynes. Would anyone else like to address the board? Hello. Hello. I am Erin Walker, and Ayana made me a little emotional, but I said I wasn't going to cry. Um, I'm 1400 Lee Street. Um, wow, I didn't think this. I would feel like this. Um, I've had four boys, black boys, tall black boys, which make a difference for some reason with people um, when they see them come through Midland Public Schools. And when I first moved here, it was very, I mean, I, I loved it here. It was very nice. Came from an inner city, so it was a very nice change um, for them. I wanted them to have better, okay? So I said, okay, we'll go to Midland to be better. And now, 20 some years later, I realized that in some of it, I may have made a mistake. And I say that to say, I tried to take him out of one situation, but I put him into another. Um, I remember when my oldest son, first started at Millen, um, Millen High. And I remember um, all my kids, we all went together to kind of send him off for his new start. Before we walked into the door, it was a group of three Caucasian boys that said, hell Hitler, put up the symbol, the hand motion. And that was my son's first experience at Millen High. And I remember being scared for him um, because I didn't know what he was getting himself into. And I wasn't there to be able to protect him. And um, one thing that I've always taught my children is that racism is there. People will treat you differently sometimes. It's a part of life. So I've never tried to sugarcoat that and say that you won't experience it. But what I was disappointed in was when I've gone to um, different people in administration, um, and, and, and while I thought that they were empathetic in a way, it was still that idea that the conversation was never had. It was almost like it didn't happen. And then, so how do you fix something if you don't talk about it, if you don't address that this is something that's going on? Um, so for the 
years in elementary school, I remember things happening, middle school, high school, and the conversation still has not happened, okay? And you know, you get the things and people say, okay, well, we talked about this, we talked about that, but racism is different than domestic violence. It's different than this, it's different than that. Racism is something that has to be addressed so we can solve it. Um, for me, all I ask is to see me. Sometimes I feel like people of color are invisible here because people don't want to address the issues. So you just don't see us, you don't hear us, but we're here. We are here and we are a part of the community. We pay the same taxes, we live on the same streets, and I feel like our children should be heard and we should be heard. And as people in your position, I just, I beg of you to have the conversation we need to have the conversation when slavery is talking in school, which is all the time. Um, I remember a child told my son that they wish it was still going on and could you be my slave? Um, my son was actually a part of the Blackfish conversation that I found out through a parent. No one even called me that um, to let me know that it happened. So all I ask is for us to be seen, have some empathy. You may not understand what it feels like to be the only black person on a football team the only black person in the classroom, the only black person in your whole job. <laughs> I've been at a job where I've been the only black person there. And you may not understand that because you're surrounded by people that look like you. When you are already different, that's already its own struggle. And then when you are ignored and made fun of because of those differences, then that just kind of, uh, builds you know this mound of pressure that you have to deal with and you're having children go to school to try to get education and sometimes not only if they're black but if they don't have the same they're not in the same class as others they get treated differently i've seen kids of color get treated differently in regards of um discipline that children that look different than them have done the same exact thing and things are different. So all I ask is for some type of equality and some steady policy across the board for everybody, no matter what people look like, no matter what class they come from, for everybody to be treated the same. And all I ask is for you just to see us. We are here and we wanna be a part of the community, but sometimes you feel isolated when things like this happen. And you know, people wonder why people don't wanna give their addresses. People have been harassed. People have been bullied for standing up and saying, we want to be treated the same. People come to your house, they give you threatening calls and letters, and that's a hard thing to deal with, especially when you go to the people who are empowered to make those changes to kind of help with that type of thing, and nothing happens. So all I ask is just see us, have the conversations, have the empathy, so we can all be one community together. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Um, if anyone else comes up, if you don't want to give us your address on the microphone, please feel free just to write it down. I wasn't planning to speak tonight, so I have nothing prepared, so I won't be very eloquent. Um, my name is Judy McAtee. My address is 2213 Westbury. I'm incredibly saddened that anyone in this audience tonight had to come up here and hand you a piece of paper with their address on it. I'm incredibly saddened that the threat, the threatening feeling of a, openly in this environment, giving out an address had to be experienced by anybody in this room tonight. That saddens me. I don't have to do that. I don't feel the need to do that. I'm here, I'm, I'm speaking mainly because I've thought about it all week and um, as a community member. Some of you know I've had children that all, four children that graduated from Midland High. We had a great experience here. I'm not here as a mother of four children tonight. I'm here as a community member. I am a therapist in this community. I've been in private practice as a therapist, psychotherapist, since we arrived here 27 years ago. Um, and I pick up the pieces as a therapist, I, behind closed doors where they can speak openly, where they can and do feel emotional, they, I mean, anyone in our community who seeks someone like me out to discuss the emotional fragility or the emotional destruction that has happened in their life. I can tell you that since the, this school year alone, the 
it, there's been a huge increase in my practice of both adults and students, but students who feel they don't have a voice. I hear that over and over and over. I'm scared or I don't have a voice. They're not listening to me. No one listens to me. I had a fifth grader with the highest anxiety I've ever seen because he is afraid to go to middle school because he's afraid he will be shoved into a locker and locked in. Now, I know that's sort of your typical fear of kids not getting their lockers open when they're going to middle school. This young person was definitely petrified. And he was petrified because he said, I know it can happen. And I just wanted to speak from a community, as a community member, as a professional in the community whose job it is to listen and to help people understand that um, they have a, re their fear is a reality. This, it's a reality. It's not something we just listen to and say, oh, we understand or we'll do something about. I'm here to say, not just listen. Everybody's saying, please listen to the uh, folks of color in our community. They know best. They know what it's like, but act. It's time not to just listen. My job is to listen. I can't act in my professional office with four spaces. The board has the power. The teachers have the power, if given the power, to listen. Thank you. Or to listen and act. That and <laughs> Thank you, Ms. McAtee. My name is Cheryl Levy, 1726 McGregor Street. I wasn't going to speak either, but we've talked about, we've, we've heard these eloquent pleas. So what do we do about it? Well, as a children's literature specialist and a, a youth services librarian for many years, and also a professor of children's and young adult literature at Saginaw Valley and Delta College, I think one of the answers is through literature and what we choose to show to our, our students. And I was very distressed because I sub in the schools and um, a couple of years ago, we, I was in fourth grade and the social studies was on racism or uh, segregation in Michigan. And these fourth graders raised their hand, Mrs. Levy, do you know that there was this girl named Ruby Bridges and, and she was, and, and terrible things, white people were screaming at her because she wanted to go to school with white children and they had seen the movie about it. And she said, and then they said, and the kids can't see that movie anymore because it was shown at a school and imagine this, a white kid then used the N-word out in the playground with, a, with an African-American kid. And it was terrible, but the movie was pulled as a response to that, and the movie should be shown even more. And I, I just, uh, we just saw the movie They Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. It's a best-selling book about what it's like to be a black kid. And, and how you are treated by police. She's written another bestseller that's just come out and I'm in the halfway through it called On the Come Up. And that's what our kids need to be exposed to. And I was talking to one of the high school English teachers and she said that the English teachers would like to use the hate you give in the literature classes, but then everybody, oh, it drops the F-bomb 59 times. The kids know the F-bomb. We don't have to fear the F-bomb. What we have to fear is white kids in Midland not having a clue what it's like to be black in our society, how you are treated by teachers. She, the, the, the protagonist in, uh, on the come up is going, her, her mother wants her out of the ghetto, so sends her to this magnet school for artists. She wants to be a rap star like her father who was shot. Um, and you see what white privilege is like in an elite school system. And I think it's through literature like that, and not making it just for the kids whose, appro whose parents approve, but exposing all of our students to real literature, real movies. I was so proud of Midland High for doing the play, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night, because it starred an autistic boy, and you saw what it's like to be autistic. And now Midland High Drama has an autistic boy in their next play, Newsies. It's that kind of inclusion by exposing our, our students to that, a culture that's not their own, that we open their minds to it. 
just, you know, all of us crying and, and praying and all this other stuff. They have to make it real. It has to be real for them to know, for example, when they give the Nazi salute, what that truly represents. And it's, they're not going to know that unless we talk about in real terms, using language they can understand. So I would ask the, the administration not to be so quick to pull a book because it has F-bombs in it, but what it really says to these students in a language they understand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Levy. Good evening. I'm Sarah Schultz. I'm at uh, 5611 Siebert Street. Uh, I also was not planning on speaking tonight. It seems like a theme, uh, which is why I'm in my cozy purple shirt and not my uh, public speaker shirt. Um, I was, my role tonight was going to be just sit in the audience and be supportive and listen. I was going to be here with all my other friends in purple uh, supporting Ayana and Aaron and Amy as they spoke, but also uh, several students who had planned to speak tonight. But then I found out on the way here, literally on my drive here, that the students who planned to come tonight decided not to come. They were going to speak um, tonight, not just about the, the video or the catalyst that sort of brought us all here, but they were going to tell us about their lived experiences in the schools, about the culture and the environment that is in the schools that led to and made it possible for that video to be made. And I've been listening to these students and others and these parents and others, and I wish they were here tonight because their stories are so amazing. And I, I won't tell them for you, but if you get a chance to listen to them, please do. They're heartbreaking and eye-opening. So there's probably many reasons why these students decided not to come tonight. But one of them is because they don't believe that speaking here tonight to all of you will make a difference. So I decided to come up and speak and let you know that. Because I want us adults in this room to show them that that's not true. They believe that, they believe that speaking won't make a difference because they feel like they have spoken before. That they have, and they haven't seen results. One mom told me once that uh, this is a mom of uh, students of color. She said, our family is all talked out about these issues. We can do better than that. We can cut through the jargon and the plans and the words. We can find a path to true empathy of the lived experiences of students of color in our schools. It's true, it's true that these issues of racism, they're bigger than our schools. They're bigger than Midland. They're bigger than our country. But you, you could call me an idealist, but I think that we can build a culture and an environment in our schools that's better than the world outside the schools. So I appreciate the inclusion update, I do. And it sounds like we're in the beginning stages of making plans. So I appreciate what I heard was an openness, openness to hear more ideas. I really do. And we have some. So in order to create an inclusive school district, we're advocating tonight that the disciplinary policies should be uniform and consistent among schools and applied equally regardless of race or background. This policy should clearly state that bullying of all types, but particularly based on race, ethnicity, religion, gender, or sexuality, will not be tolerated. Further, we advocate that discipline guidelines and dress code policies align between the two high schools and follow the example of those in the Dow High Handbook. We advocate for the Diversity and Inclusion Committee to seek out and respond to the needs of minority students and their families that the makeup of the committee should reflect the diversity of the, school, the student population. 
We advocate for more professional development for teachers and administrators specifically to address implicit bias, and we advocate for real training and restorative justice techniques. We're advocating that the curriculum should be reevaluated through anti-racist and inclusion-minded lens so that we are teaching the positive contributions of all people regardless of race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. And lastly, we advocate that the school district hire a diversity and inclusion officer. That person should provide the vision and leadership in promoting an institutional uh, culture that values and supports diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this diversity and inclusion officer should be responsible for working with relevant stakeholders to develop and implement effective diversity policies and practices. And the officer should also develop and implement programming that cultivates a welcoming and inclusive community. So I have, um, I have a handout if you're willing to take it sure. with all sure. of these ideas. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Schultz. I didn't plan on talking today. <laughs> but we're on a roll. We might as well go with it. Uh, my name is Umberine Jamil, 2173 East Mockingbird Lane. So there was a massacre in New Zealand on Friday at a mosque. 50 Muslims were killed, and I'm Muslim. Um, I have two daughters that go to Delhi, and they cover. So you can imagine any time an event like that happens, I hold my breath, and I actually told them um, Friday morning, don't walk alone, be careful, make sure you have friends with you. We live in such an ugly world right now. Islamophobia is on the rise. Um, when my eldest son was at Jefferson several years ago, um, two kids in Spanish class called him a terrorist. So this stuff is happening. Um, I've been a substitute teacher for kindergarten um, for a few years at Chestnut Hill. And now I have a kindergartner at Adams. and. Kids are so innocent, you know, they want to learn. I mean, when I go into the classroom every week, I mean, I'm Mrs. Khan. I mean, they, they treat me as they would treat anyone. I mean, they don't see anything different in me. So what we need to do is we need to take that innocence at that young age, and we need to introduce them to as much diversity and introduce them to the idea that people are different, but they're all the same. Right? They might look different, they, different skin color, different way of dressing, but they essentially are all the same, right? Laugh the same way, cry the same way. And so my senior daughter um, at Dow High, we asked her to speak at the vigil last night uh, that we had at the Islamic Center, standing room only, 250 beautiful people of Midland showed up to, to pray with us for the victims. And um, so she wrote the speech herself. Um, some of you heard it yesterday. It was it, amazing. It was amazing. It was amazing. I mean, um, my dad, I, I talked to my dad today, and he's just like, he was blown away by her words. And part of the words were very sad, because what she said is when she found out about the massacre, you know, she said she wasn't shocked at all, you know. And she said she would be naive to think if it's not going to happen again, you know, because until we start instilling a more or creating a more tolerant society, a loving society where we accept differences, you know, the, the more we create this us versus them mentality, whether it be white versus black, Muslim versus non-Muslim, you know, it's going to keep happening. And I mean, Introducing children to, to, you know, people that are different from them is one step. Um, Dr. Vanette talked about 
how you don't teach about, you know, Afri it's not taught about the African American contribution. Well, there's plenty of Muslim contributions not taught about in terms of math and science and, you know, um, and actually one of the teachers at Dow High said to my daughter a couple of weeks ago, you know, isn't it weird, and she said this in her speech, that when you read about Muslims in history textbooks, you read about, you know, the Muslim killer, the Muslim crusader, you know, it's, it's always the religion attached, but if a non-Muslim did anything that maybe wasn't right, it's always an Irish woman or a French, you know. So the, Mus the, the Muslim always comes with that Muslim, always. It's a, it's a Muslim. It's not a, you know, whatever ethnicity it may be. So, um, I don't know, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of work. And I talked to a retired um, kindergarten teacher from Chestnut Hill yesterday, and we talked about how we can fix it, but we just need to do diversity training for teachers, yes, but we need to bring it into the classroom, whether we do it individual classroom, and we, whether we do it through assemblies, uh, you know, there's, there's a very diverse community in uh, Midland, so use the people of Midland, get them into your schools so, you, so the kids are, you know, interacting with them and you take away the, the ignorance and if you take away the ignorance, you take away the fear, you take away the fear, they're not going to hate anymore and it's doable. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jamil. Ella Marie Schroeder, 1002 Scenic Drive. I'd like to just add to what Umberine said. The service last night was amazing. It was beautiful. There were two, over 250 people there, so I'm certain I did not see everyone who came in. I did not see any of you. It's possible you were there and I missed you, but you are community leaders. And our children learn not just by what they are told in the classroom, but by what they see, by the actions of the adults around them. Many of the people here in the audience were in attendance last night. It was a pretty predictable group. It was the same people I've seen at many such events. We teach by who we are and by what we do and we can all do better. And I would like to suggest that our community leaders don't just pull in the community to the classrooms. I would like them to go out and be part of the community in some ways that I haven't seen you being. Yeah. Go out and meet other people because when we make interfaith friends, we start to change our own personal worlds, and that has a really wide, um, it causes ripples. I didn't mean to speak tonight either, so I'm just kind of at a loss. I'm done. Thank you, Ms. Schroeder. Uh, Jeff Cairo, 3801 Sweetbriar. Um, I come to you as a uh, parent and a concerned, concerned community member. Um, I also did not plan on speaking tonight, but uh, fe felt moved. Um, a couple things that I'd, I'd love to see, I, I'd, I'd like to just challenge and encourage administration to look at doing, and, and it's building on a number of things that were said here already. You know, one thing I, I see, I have a, a child in elementary school and I have a high schooler. And in elementary with PIP, we saw a great presentation tonight, phenomenal. I'd love to see race thrown in there as one of the things that's, it's, yeah. they're not too early. You know, I, I teach elementary myself in a neighboring district. Um, it's now's the time. It's important. You know, they can they can build from there. You know, I'd like to like to see some connections. You know, there's right now there seems to be a disjoint with PYP in the elementary and then IB at the high school and then what's happening in the middle school. You know, so I'd like to see more connection there um, and building on the race, building on the diversity. Uh, I grew up in Midland. I think I think the schools are phenomenal. I look around at the board and I see some folks that I went to school with that grew up here as well. Um, 
bringing back a little history, there was a number of years ago, the Midland Public Schools made a decision when I was a child that the teaching force needed to be more diverse. And they actively sought diversity in the classroom. Now is the time to make that happen. We need more diversity in our classrooms. We need more African American teachers. We need more Hispanic teachers. We need more. We need more Muslim teachers. There needs to be diversity. And I know that's going to be. I know that's going to be. There's some work. There's not as many folks going into education. But where there's a will, there's a way. And I, I certainly hope that we have the will in our administration to become more diverse. I love some of the things I heard that are happening tonight already. They've been doing, um, but I, I haven't heard about that step. And I, I hope that's going to be the next step. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cairo. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board tonight? I'm Julie Ortiz. I live at 1305 North Parkway. I also was not going to speak, but an idea came into my mind that I've been thinking about. Um, I read periodically that some of the textbooks that are coming into the school system are not only correct, but um, they leave out important things, too. It, it's not just what you say, but how you say it. And I do hope that our school reviews our textbooks often on history and and how it really happened because I think it can start out if you start out with the wrong idea to begin with then it's hard to change later with young children so they need to know the whole story even if it's a terrible story they we need to face up to it and say yep this is a terrible story and this happened and we don't want it to happen again so um, hopefully, how often do you review the textbooks for history and so on? I could get back to you. We, oh, OK. I was just wondering. I don't know, I don't know that. Uh, and yeah. We could check into it for you. That would be great, because um, things that are left out are just as important as, as um, things that are not factual to begin with. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thanks, Ms. Ortiz. Good evening. I'm Larry Levy. Uh, my family and I came to town in 1977. We've lived here ever since. Our kids went through the Midland Public Schools. I taught at Delta for many years. I've taught 40 years altogether, preschool through grad school. Um, Brad, John, I may have handed you your diplomas when you graduated. Um, many years ago, I was invited by a third grade teacher in Midland. She knew that I taught a course called Literature and History of the Holocaust at Delta College. She knew I'd received a fellowship that allowed me to go to Poland, to Auschwitz, to Majdanek, to Treblinka, to Jerusalem, to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial. Um, and she wondered if I would visit her third grade class as I had visited many places around the Tri-Cities, schools, community groups, houses of worship, and come to her third grade class. And I thought, well, I had a great deal of respect for this teacher. She's one named on the plaque outside as the winner of the diversity award, now retired. But I remember thinking, there's no way I'm going to go in there and start talking about anti-Semitism, about death camps, about gas chambers, about even yellow stars, I don't think. So I thought a long time about what can I do with third graders, and I came upon something. It, it, it seems kind of innocuous in a way, kind of simple. But I'm listening to what some folks said today about somehow it has to be more real. So I really didn't say anything about the Holocaust. I don't think the word ever even came up. I asked them all to take out sheets of paper. And um, I first asked these third graders to list as many ways as they could think of that people were different. Third graders love to make lists. They went on and on and on. They dictated to me. We filled the blackboard with all the ways that people could be different. And then I asked them two questions, uh, one at a time. The first one was I wanted them to think of a time 
when they were in the majority, somebody different came into their midst. What was the situation? How was that person different? How was that person treated? How did you treat that person? Just recall that time if you can. And then, and then I just waited to see what would happen. All the pencils in the room started moving. So I don't know what they're writing, but my hunch is, my experience tells me as a teacher, that to the best of their ability, they were trying to recall a situation in their lives, just like that. So when they finished, I said on the flip side of the page, uh, I'd like you to think of a time when you were in the minority for some reason. And the board was filled with a possible reason. But I said, were you ever in the minority for some reason? And what was that situation? And how were you treated? And how did that feel? And why do you still recall it? You know, And they all wrote, every one of them. And they exchanged. And a few people in the room offered their there are stories which were interesting uh, and, and honest. And um, so I did that again once at a different school, invited to come in this time with, I don't remember if they were third or fourth graders, another elementary school. And I thought, well, it worked in that one. I'll try it again. And I will never forget what one of the kids said when I said, you know, a time when you were different. They were all sitting on the floor of the library in the elementary school. This was at Carpenter then. And um, one little boy said, well, I moved here from Bay City. And I didn't know anybody here. So I, I felt different. And um, I didn't have any friends. Um, and I was a little worried that people might make fun of me because of my hand. And he held up his hand, which was deformed. The room got real quiet. He says, but then I went out on the playground. He said it might have even been the first day that he arrived. They went out on the playground, and everybody was in their groups playing, doing what they wanted to do. And he says, and then and he points across the room. And he says, and then Jimmy came over. And there's Jimmy sitting there. Looked like an ordinary kid, just an ordinary kid, you know? And he just kind of smiled back and he said, Jimmy came over and said, hey, you want to kick the ball around? He said it was huge. I'll take another 30 seconds if you don't mind. Go ahead. Because given an opportunity just a few weeks ago to meet with some high school teachers in this town, secondary social studies teachers, and a few secondary middle school teachers. And the topic here really was teaching the Holocaust. But I decided that, among other things that we might get to about teaching the Holocaust, I asked them the same questions. It really doesn't matter how old you are, but I wondered how real it was for them. When were you in the majority? When were you in the minority? They all wrote, and a few shared. I'm just saying that the evening began with some wonderful talk about not just what we teach, but how we teach it. I'm thinking, and what I've heard people say as well, about listening. Well, you know, um, it's probably the best thing I learned in 40 years of teaching was to ask a question and ask everybody in the room to pick up a sheet of paper and pencil and to write an answer to it, where you don't know what the answer is, but you assume that they have an answer. And I've seen it happen just a, that recently. Um, before I met with the teachers, on very short notice, uh, Connie Steger at Midland High invited me on very short notice to come into Midland High on a Friday because half of the ninth grade class was getting on a bus and going down to the Holocaust Museum. The other half we needed to do something with. Would I be willing to come in? So I came in, she said, you'll be meeting with groups of kids all day, <laughs> small groups of kids. You know, I'm retired. This is a lot of stamina for me that I've got to muster. And they were groups of 10, 15, 20, 30. They came one after another. And what was I going to do with them, I thought. First group, I actually did the stupidest thing I could have done, which was start to lecture. I had stuff on the board. I had an outline. And then I said, don't do that. Don't do that. 
I gave him three by five cards. All the rest of the groups. What do you know or think you know about the Holocaust? Right. What don't you know about the Holocaust that you think you need to know? And finally, why in 2019 do people in Midland, Michigan even know you need to know? What's, what, why do you need to know that? Very often that was the one we would talk most about. But I collected them all because there was only so much time to respond to those questions. But the point is, they were all capable of speaking. Thank you. Every single person. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Levy. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Um, hi, I'm Amelia Jenkins. Um, my address is 1205 Sterling Court, and I'm a junior at Dell High School. Um, I'm also a uh, an IB to diploma candidate, and in none of my classes did we talk about the recent issue with race, um, the racist video. TOK, or Theory of Knowledge, was the only class that we discussed this and had a, construction co a constructive conversation about it. And racism is something that's so prevalent in our society today that it needs to be talked about with students. I personally have never had a discussion in my time, my six years in Midland Public Schools, about racism and how it affects people in our community, in my life. We need to have discussions like this because we need to be inclusive with all races. Um, okay. <laughs> Recently, I was talking to an African-American friend of mine. And I was genuinely shocked at the amount of racism that, racism that he has um, seen throughout his years in Midland Public Schools. Um, I was shocked due to the fact that we do not talk about racism in our classrooms. We don't talk about the small racial, racial slurs that you hear in the hallways, or especially the large issues that happen, um, like the video that was just a problem a couple weeks ago. This lack of communication needs to change in classrooms because it will still become issues. We will still be making, people will still be making racist videos, people will still be using racial slurs, and this is not okay. Um, this issue needs to be solved, and I just ask of you to please start getting people to talk about this in classrooms, in so, like schools, because it's just not something that is acceptable in our society today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jenkins. Is there anyone else who would like to speak tonight? Hello, Francisca Himmer. I wasn't prepared, so I didn't have my address on a paper, so I'll give it, write it down after. Um, but I'd just like to just shed some light that we do have some Afri a lot of African Americans here and people of color in Midland who stay and we go to Midland public schools like myself. I have students at Seabirt. Um, and so far the experience has, has gone pretty well. You know, you have your typical experience like with my daughter's hair and you, but I tell her, you know, those things are to ex be expected and we go on. But I wanted to sh shed some light on some families who are actually living in Midland, work for Dow and live in Midland for the convenience of being close to work and because of their long hours, but choose to put their children on a bus to go to Saginaw so that their children feel more comfortable. So to me, that's really telling. I'm here living and working in a community, but I'm shipping my kids, putting them on a bus for a half an hour a day to go to school, when in some cases the school is Midland Public Schools is across the street. So I think that's very, that's very telling. And it's been because of either ex lived experiences that they've heard from other African Americans attending Mid Midland Public Schools, or they attended the school for, in one case, a month, and then transferred their student because of the experience that they had in school. Um, some, some of us have thicker skins than others, but just wanted to shed light that there are those people living in Midland. And that's a big reason why we really need to not only just talk about what's going on and listen and plan, 
but know that change is going to take time, right? It's not going to happen overnight. We're going to make the efforts to change and we want to work together with you to make that process go faster, but also attacking those policies right away. You know, like when Sarah said about the handbook, that is a very simple, concrete thing that we can do right away to start sending that message that we will not tolerate racism and people being made to feel unwelcome because of race, their race or ethnicity or sexuality. And we need to not tolerate those things. So the handbook is a very simple first step that we can take so that we can start feeling some of that progress. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come up and speak? Looks like everyone who wanted to speak has spoken. Uh, I want to thank each of you for coming tonight and taking the time out of your schedule and sharing what this is such an important topic for our community, sharing your heart and sharing your experiences and your hopes and your dreams for, for us as a school district, for us as a community. And I believe that, you know, we are on a journey together and um, you definitely have our attention and um, we'll take what you have said and shared tonight and uh, spend some time thinking about it and and create a plan and move, move forward. We have a lot of things going right now, but I'm sure with the input that you've shared uh, that will inform what we're doing as well. So thank you for for taking the time. And we will move into now item five, which is curriculum instruction and assessment. Should we wait just a minute or two? I think sure. you better not. Oh, uh, we might run out of time. Correct. All right. Uh, moving into item 5.1, 5, 5 we have uh, minutes. Yes, the curriculum instruction and assessment study committee met on Monday, February 18th. And the main item that we discussed was the Prodigy program. Brian Bruton and Luann Bensinger shared information about Prodigy, the district's updated learning program for advanced students in grades three to five. Prodigy stands for promoting rigorous opportunities to develop innovative and gifted youth. The program began as a pilot this current year at Central Park, Chestnut Hill, and Plymouth. Prodigy will be offered in all and elementary schools for the 2019-20 school year with a target of serving the top three to five percent of students at each building. Students who qualify for Prodigy attend a before school learning experience two days per week where they engage in enhanced core learning experiences and transdisciplinary work that connects English, language arts, mathematics, science, and social studies. The focus of Prodigy challenges students to apply their learning through multiple activities across the curriculum. In addition to Prodigy, fifth grade students will have the opportunity to cross grade in mathematics per the district process. The district looks forward to serving a greater number of students through Prodigy than we have been able to serve in the past at the elementary level. And we adjourned at 3.30 and um, we met today, but those minutes will be at the next meeting. Great. Thanks, Len. We'll move into item 6, 6 6.1, which is FFO minutes. Uh, Ms. Friedel. Um We met on March 4th. The uh, bond was updated, reviewed, and discussed by Mr. Dombro with the committee. Um, the high school concrete work that went unawarded as a package bid, we went over that today. We bid and approved the, the current uh, package amount with Tri-City Ground Breakers. Finance facilities and operation, Mr. Cooper reviewed and discussed the following items with the committee. January financial report, the CNC router bid, which we 
uh, bid on and approved today. Uh, progress and timeline on the sale of bonds in the uh, Series 2 of the bond millage approved in 2015. A follow-up on the Michigan School Safety Grant installation of boots on all doors due to cost and possible installation and reinstallation problems with the device and the floor, it was recommended to proceed with the installation on new doors only at this time. Yo and Yo audit renewal, this is a five-year renewal with the initial 2019 rate of 29,000 for the audit and single audit with an additional 1,000 for bond testing. Um, they've been our board auditors since 1972-73. Um, item 6, uh, 2019 summer wage rates for teachers employed for summer school, curricular study, professional development, and other extended services. And the seventh item was the ele elevator repairs at Northeast were discussed. MEI, Michigan Elevator of Livonia, Michigan, was doing the repairs. Our next FFO meeting is Monday, April 1st at 5 p.m. Thank you, Mary. And we'll move into item 6.2 for information. Uh, yes, Mr. Yeah, Cooper. I have both uh, 6.2 and 6.3. They're both for information. Do not require action on your part. First, we have 17 gifts for $13,072 and, <coughs> excuse me, 14 cents. Wide range there. So I won't name all those. They do go by on our board uh, broadcast at the end of the meeting. Um, under 6.3, I have two items, not so much as a, a dollar amount attached to them, but they were gifts of items. The one was from Hemlock Semiconductor, where they gave us two welding machines and welding equipment, which was a very nice gift. And the other one was from King's Daughters Nursing Home, where they had a commercial reach-in cooler refrigerator uh, that they were updating and gave us a relatively new model. Um, as a gift. So both nice gifts, uh, more unusual for us to get an item, but we do occasionally, so uh, we separate those. But none of those require action tonight from you. Thank you. And then we have uh, items 7.1. Yep, we have condolences to pass on to two families this evening. First to the family of Mr. Richard Hunt, who passed away on February the 17th. Mr. Hunt was a science teacher at Northeast for 35 years, retiring in 1995. And then also to the family of Mrs. Susan Burgess, who passed away on February 22nd. Mrs. Burgess taught math and music at H.H. Dow High in Jefferson for 15 years, retiring in 1998. Uh, and then in item 7.2, uh, we have 14 retirements to announce this evening, so we pass our congratulations and thanks on to the following that are retiring. Luann Bensinger, Stephanie Bonecamp, Jamie Dahl, Craig Hawkins, Lorraine Hawkins, Deanna Jewell, Carrie Keeley, Paul Kohani, Kelly Krause, Dorothy Metcalf, Laura Peterson, Kathy Romaine, Peter Vanderbush, and Peter Welter. We thank them for their service to the district. Absolutely. Thank you, Brian. Uh, item 8 is scheduled activities for information, just uh, the remainder of the school board meetings for the rest of the year. Item 9 is correspondence to and from the Board of Education. We have letters that go uh, to many folks. Item 9.1 and item 9.2, uh, more letters to the Board of Education. A FOIA request from uh, a community member and a FOIA request from Girl Scouts. Then we'll move into item 10, which is study, uh, study discussion session. So why don't I start over here with Mary? Um, looking forward to the first robotics uh, district competition this Friday and Saturday at Dow High. Best wishes to both of our high school champion teams. Um, doesn't cost you anything to get in. Um, and it's a wonderful opportunity to see that showcase. Thank you again for all the people who came to speak, the people who uh, presented the PYP. Um, and uh, I, watching, uh, I was watching a video this afternoon from uh, Central auditorium of the first graders at uh, Central um, Central Park uh, Elementary School, their music performance, and on the video, the, the facilities look just fabulous. It, and so a thank you goes out again to our taxpayers for, for making that possible with the bond. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I'd like to start out by saying thank you to Bob and your team for the budget update. Uh, Shining Stars, Mr. Wong and Megan Feese. 
um, the great PYP planner presentation. Um, 72 houses all at the same time. That must be quite a feat <laughs> as a coordinator and director to have 72 houses under construction and or in some stage of remodel all at the same time. Um, obviously over the last week or two I want to do some research on my own, understand things, become more informed and uh, something that I found, I don't know if everybody else knows about this except me, but I thought this was really awesome in that um, something that exists at Michigan State University and uh, it's a web page. Students plus social media plus free speech equals a volatile mix. Students desire to express themselves freely. Students desire to express themselves freely can get them in big trouble. Suspensions, expulsions, arrests, and even lawsuits because social media has blurred the lines and made student free speech even more confusing and volatile. To help students and their teachers understand their free speech rights and limitation, Michigan State University's College of Law launched the McClellan Online Free Speech Library. The online resource answers a range of First Amendment questions from the seemingly, seemingly innocuous is using the design of a popular board game as a theme for a homecoming copyright infringement, to the more serious can a school suspend students for attacking another student on social media. Run by Michigan State's First Amendment Law Clinic, law professors and law students provide answers on these and a variety of other issues including censorship, FOIA, libel, privacy, student press rights, student protests, and self-expression. As you go through there, there's also very simple little quizzes that you can take to quiz yourself on yes and no or correct answers or not correct answers of what you can and cannot do, what is First Amendment, what isn't, and that also it doesn't exactly mirror uh, our MPS board policy 5517, but they tell you what you can and cannot say or what you can and cannot do. And uh, MSU's First Amendment Clinic has trained 8,000 high school students and uh, it does First Amendment workshops. I know we're talking about much more things than First Amendment, but the dangers of social media that are out there, um, it's great for any tool to learn, to learn uh, what your rights are, what they aren't, especially for our students. I don't know, could they pass all of those quizzes that are on there? Do they know the lines? Do we know the lines? Um, The Board of Education has the legal right to expel students and they violate 5517 if they do something that violates that, they have the right to do that. But also we have to have a catalyst for change. Um, maybe it's going to take time. We have research to do. Mike is working on it with his group. The training, all of that is going to take time. Um, maybe we have a high school group that's formed that goes to all sixth and seventh grade classrooms throughout the district and talks to those kids who would look up to these high school kids and tell them about the dangers of social media. Teach them about their First Amendment rights. As well as the Middle Public School Board Policy 5517 and what you can and cannot do. As well as inclusion training and diversity training. So my vote was my vote for this reason I don't want to expel kids. I'd rather train them, teach them, correct them, help everybody. So this was a standalone thing, but hopefully in the future we can make some change and make some progress. So that's it for me. Well, I would like to congratulate, congratulate our shining stars as well. It's nice to see. I see Megan every time I walk in here, so it was nice to see, see her. Um, recognized tonight and Mr. Wong I've heard such great things about his class that I am definitely going to go and watch some of those videos so um, about the great things you're doing with our students with the Chinese program and speaking of students there's been a lot of competitions uh, going on with math and science and music and um, I just applaud all the students the staff and even the, the families that um, support our students because they are doing incredible incredible things not only just here but some of them are going to state competitions and, and further with some of their 
their um, talents. And PYP was wonderful. I've um, been on the board long enough that um, I was around for the beginnings of talking about initiating PYP, and it's just been really exciting to see how that program has grown. And for uh, anyone that's interested, the fifth graders do their PYP exhibition, which, which ties in their, all their years of PYP. And I believe, is it tomorrow at Central Park Elementary? And then um, Plymouth is on Thursday. It's about 5.30. And they love to have people come in, and you can see what these kids have learned and, and the, the excitement they have about learning and their topics. They choose their topics. They work in a group. And uh, some of them even address some of the concerns that were spoken about tonight as uh, fifth graders. So I encourage you, if you have a chance, to stop in. It's very open and, and not formal. So it's fun to see what our kiddos have, have um, done over the years. And to our um, speakers, thank you. Thank you for coming and sharing your ideas, um, your thoughts. I know just personally myself, I'm sorry that anyone has to ever go through life feeling this way. Um, I have extended family members have, that have been through some issues like this over years. And um, just know that as a school district that we are part of a community. And this we can't fix it. Everybody from home life to their community to our schools to our churches to wherever we are, our businesses, we all have to work together. And it's going to take a while, and it's sad that um, the world is this way, but I really believe I'm an optimist, and I think by us being open and sharing our ideas and working together, we'll get through this just as they have in other generations and past decades. So thank you for sharing, and with positive in input and working together, we can make big changes. It's 9.25. We need to go through the rest of us. Mike, maybe I get a motion for another 10 minutes added. Other, we, we can only go till 9.30 without a motion and, and unanimous consent. Make a motion to extend my, till 9.45. Support. Motion by Phil. Support by Mary. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Scott. Okay. Uh, just to pile on the, the uh, shining stars a little bit, I rarely, well, I shouldn't say rarely, recently I've been approached several times about Mr. Wong and how incredible he is and the need to replicate him for other classrooms. Um, I, 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 people I don't even know who know that I serve on the board say this guy is great, his interaction with my student is phenomenal. Not only that is that cool, but I get to see videos and, and all of these different things, the emails and the communications that, that Mike mentioned um, are real and they are really appreciated. Uh, so he's, he's setting the bar high and it's great to know that he's out there uh, doing the job that he's doing. Um, just to comment briefly about uh, the speakers tonight, um, it was a very courageous thing to do to, to come forward. Um, I appreciate that. I think this entire board and the administration and the school district as a whole appreciates your voice. Um, use it. We love it. Don't be afraid to speak up, uh, not only in this forum, but other forums uh, across this community to, to raise awareness. Uh, you know, sadly, racism exists, and it's a terrible, archaic <laughs> reality that we have to deal with. And rest assured, your, your, your statements tonight did not fall on deaf ears. Uh, we will work to address this and to do our very best to eradicate it. That's all I have to say tonight. Thank you. John? Thank you. Ms. Haynes, I, I want to thank you in particular for being here uh, to speak tonight. I want to thank everyone that spoke tonight, but in, in particular the moms who were here to talk about the, the impact on their children. I think that was very moving for me and it was very impactful and I want to thank you for for being here to share that. Um, obviously, it was very difficult, but a very important message for us to hear. Um, and I want to assure you, you know, I, Sarah referred to, to the catalyst. We didn't talk a lot about the catalyst tonight because we're limited. I mean, the, the fact that we're limited by FERPA and privacy rights to talk about 
what caused everyone to be here doesn't mean that we're not talking about it. So the fact that you didn't hear us talk in a public meeting about it tonight, please don't take that as we're not listening and we're not acting because we are and, and we will continue to do so. So thank you very much. That's all I have. A lot of what I wanted to say tonight has already been said, um, so I'll start briefly with with uh, the PYP overview was phenomenal, and I love the analogy. It really helped drive it home for me. Um, to address what a lot of people came here to talk about tonight, I just want to extend a heartfelt thank you, um, especially to the moms in the room. And as John said, it, it, it was a very courageous act for many of our community members to come out. And I really hope that we can use this opportunity as a catalyst for change. Um, you know, as I've reflected on my own experience in Midland Public Schools, I looked back and said, okay, what, what did I learn about? And one of the things that was most impactful um, to make sure that I had a well-rounded education was actually, I was fortunate enough in third grade at Adams School to hear uh, Coretta Scott King speak. Um, and I actually looked up uh, and did some research over the last couple of weeks on, on her husband, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, thoughts on the purpose of education. I thought I'd share this brief paragraph from one of the essays that he wrote. It says, we must remember that intelligence is not enough. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. The complete education gives, us, gives one not only the power of concentration, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate. The broad education will, therefore, transmit to one not only the accumulated knowledge of the race, but the, also the accumulated experience of social living. And I think that's really what we're all here to talk about tonight, is how do we make sure that we're teaching the intelligence plus the character, and look forward to working with the, the district on continuing to improve um, a lot of what we talked about tonight, so. Thanks, thanks. I won't repeat anything that's already been said, but truly thankful for, for the group for sharing tonight and uh, is very meaningful to us. Um, spring break is coming, so uh, I hope everyone has a safe journey uh, to, and, a, and a healing spring break. And a reminder to our students and our parents that we have student and community flyers on the website. And a lot of times our, our parents forget or don't know how to connect kids um, to different opportunities. And there's just a, a one, a many wonderful opportunities um, that are out there on the website. Also, I'm looking forward to uh, this week, Thursday, our inclusion and diversity team uh, meeting again and reviewing our, our uh, strategy and um, it's a wonderful group of educators that really want to do the best uh, for our for our schools and for our communities so I feel fortunate to be a part of that and working toward um, a stronger better future and that's all I have so two things before I get into my usual routine one is um, for those who spoke tonight you know, as educators, we know the first thing we have to have is children safe and comfortable at school. So anytime we failed, anytime that hasn't occurred, we failed, and we take that personal. We also we take it personal anytime that we have to expel or suspend a student, and I've had to do it way too many in my 34, 35 years in this business, and I take it, and, and everyone who works for me knows we take it as a failure anytime we've done that. It is our goal to eliminate out-of-school suspension and the use of expulsion. And so that's why we've tried to use reformers practice, but like inclusion diversity, we're not there yet. And, and, and we're not, and there's those who aren't ready for that yet, but we're working very hard on that exact thing in our, in our discipline processes. And we, we are totally sold, and I'm the old guy, I'm totally sold on restorative practices the way forward. You know, it's no different than our jail systems. Jail isn't working. We need to restore our practice if we're going to go forward. So we failed on the comfort side. We failed on the student. Um, both are a disaster and happening, and now we got to try to make it and fix it and go forward, and that's what we're going to try to do. It is not going to be easy. I, no doubt about it. I've got Penny working on it. She's one person that's got a million roles, and so we'll reach out. We're, we'll work and begin to go forward on that. On the brighter side of things, I have a, 
uh, letter in front of me that says Pamela Singer received the, the, the award of distinction from the Michigan School Board Associations. And so she'll get an award from there for the courses that she's taken. And I think she joins Lynn because I think I gave Lynn one of these quite a few years ago on the same thing. So it's amount of coursework that she's done in becoming a leadership leader on the board. So great job, Pam. I appreciate that. Makes it easier to work as well as Thanks. superintendent, right? Um, Standard & Poor's Global Rating, so it's time to sell with bond, uh, Series 2 bonds. Um, the first bond series, we got a nice uh, rating. If you remember five, six years ago, our fund balance wasn't what it was today. We didn't have a stable enrollment. We weren't in the position we are today. So it's very nice to receive a AA programming with an A-plus underlying rating. I think I believe I said all that right. So in other words, these bonds will be much easier, more attractive to sell on the market um, going forward with that rating. So that was very nice to hear. Um, as in our practice in the past, we've been able to meet with our local um, state representatives. So um, we have uh, Representative Glenn and Senator Stamos coming in in April, and generally um, we meet with them and begin to talk about legislation for the upcoming year as well as the budget season. I pretty sure everything I've heard and I actually met with Jim one-on-one -on -one, um, not too long ago and it, it seems like my early indication to you guys is good luck on getting a budget number to you by July 1 they're saying that's not going to happen uh, it'll be a fall budget number and so we will have to kind of estimate the Senate the House and the governor and actually that was the practice before Governor Snyder so we're going to go back and do that I've done that before it's it's usually play your worst case scenario out to make sure you're in good position and then we'll have to do that going forward um, but we'll meet with them and talk a little more make sure they include uh, you know I've always told them if they're going to use the 2x formula on pe per people funding they had to use the 2x formula on at risk funding so if you remember we got in at 33 cents in the dollar and so they should be increasing that percent We'll see if that happens or not. We'll, we'll work on that as well. The governor's proposal was a nice uh, um, honor to schools that have been underfunded, but as you know, it's it's pretty complicated to get that kind of change quickly, and it is tied to the 45 cents tax. Uh, I feel if that doesn't go, um, that budget doesn't go. And so I don't know where you are, but that's probably not going to go. So we'll get some, some form of that, and we'll see what that happens going forward. Wrote you a little bit about robotics. Mary mentioned it. Very busy robotics cylinder center over there. Carpen was a great uh, investment for us to get that back up and open. Of course, Dow's very generous where they pay the utility costs there, um, and you know, number of elementary programs we now have, number of middle school programs we have, along with our elite high school. That's just great for kids as well. Um, HR director, we have Kyle with us today. If you have not met Kyle Kowalski, Kyle's sitting in the audience. And so Kyle was our HR manager that we've chosen to move him up on a very quick track, and he's doing a great job. And so we have Kyle with us tonight. Um, Midland High principal, Brian's interview team starts tomorrow. Yes, sir. And we're interviewing four. Correct. And, uh, and uh, af after many applicants, we narrowed it to four, and we're going to be in good shape where we go there. Whether legislation um, movement is that the governor's uh, declaration days may be forgiven. We won't know that for a while um, until they go on spring break themselves. So we're looking probably mid-April, but I'm getting a better feel that we might get those three days, our makeup days back. There, those who've got a lot more will stuff to make up days, but they're going to get a few of those back, I think. Um, Franklin Center, I wrote to you about the tentative plans for that. Hopefully all of you are comfortable. We're still ways from that. Um, next year it'll come down, but we need to talk about that property. We've met with the city, our building trades programs, and then met potentially using some of those funds um, long term into a DAO to begin to invest in our not only our building trades, but I think as it grows, all of our CTE programs and how do we sustain the funding for the equipment side there. Because it's, it's a little bit of an issue. If we haven't had so many gifts, we'd be in a little bit of a problem in some of those CTE programs. So. Um, I think most of you are pretty comfortable with that. That's all I have. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Mike. Yep. All right. At this time, I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. Someone. Support. Moved by McFar McFarland. Support by Fredell. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.